This is a Fox News alert. President Trump and his administration in an all-out fight for the border wall. Welcome to a brand new hour of America's Newsroom. I'm Sandra Smith. Feels like a Friday. Would you agree? It does. Friday, yes, folks. Folks, <laughs> right. Exclamation point. Good morning. I'm Bill Hemmer. Hope you're doing great at home. Partial government shutdown looming, and if lawmakers do not reach a deal, that's exactly what will happen next week. As the clock ticks down, neither side showing any signs of budging. Here's Sarah Sanders on that. Committed to protecting every single American citizen. He knows that without border security and without borders, you have no country at all. And he's calling on Democrats to step up and actually do their jobs and protect the American people and work with him in that process. I want to be crystal clear. There will be no additional appropriations to pay for the border wall. It's done. President Trump has several ways to avoid a shutdown. He should pick one, and soon. Ellison Barber picks up our covers live from the North Lawn there at the White House. Ellison, good morning. Good morning to you. Uh, President Trump says that uh, Democrats are being hypocrites here and that he's going to do whatever it takes to get his border wall, to get border security. Democrats say President Trump is throwing a temper tantrum. President Trump posted a video on Twitter that included old clips of Democrats talking about border security and barriers. The fact is they've always supported fences and walls and partitions, but you know what? They only don't want to do it because of me. Mr. Trump met with the top Democrats in the House and Senate this week, and they very publicly argued over funding for the border wall. The public and private part of that Oval Office meeting ended without a concrete resolution. President Trump wants $5 billion for the wall. Democrats say they're not really going to do more than 1.3. The president said he'd carry the mantle if the government shuts down. Representative Nancy Pelosi later told reporters she and the president spoke, and Trump told her the White House was looking at the options she and Senator Chuck Schumer laid out. Now there's the president's Twitter video. We posted it along with the caption, let's not do a shutdown. Democrats do what's right for the American people. Chuck and I are not in a negotiation of, we're, we're not going for the $5 billion for the wall. We simply are not. They have to put the people ahead of politics. We need to have the wall. We need border security. Whatever it takes to get border security, I will do it. I pledged that a long time ago, and I will pledge it always. About three quarters of the U.S. government is set to run out of money come December 21st. Bill. Thank you, Ellison. Ellison Barber from the White House there watching that. Thank you. Meanwhile, former Trump attorney Michael Cohen is speaking out for the first time since he was sentenced to three years behind bars. Laura Ingle is here with more on, on Cohen's interview, and he had a lot to say, Laura, in this sit-down. He certainly did. And Michael Cohen seemingly getting a lot off of his chest here, admitting in an interview with ABC's George Stephanopoulos that he knows, quote, what he did was wrong, and that he is angry with himself for his role in the deals he says he made on behalf of President Trump designed to influence the 2000. 2016 presidential election. Now, Cohen talked about many of his regrets and also explained why anyone should believe what he is saying now after admitting to and being convicted of lying to Congress. Stated emphatically that the information that I gave to them was credible and helpful. There's a substantial amount of information that they possess that corroborates the fact that I am telling the truth. So you're done with the lying. I am done with the lying. I am done being loyal to President Trump. And President Trump has pushed back against the accusations and says they are being made to make him look bad. Michael Cohen saying he will not be the villain of this story. Back to you. All right, Laura, both President Trump and Michael Cohen accusing each other in this back and forth of making these hush money deals. What more do we know? Yeah, it continues to get more interesting. Cohen says that he was showing blind loyalty to Mr. Trump as he arranged the payouts. President Trump claims he never directed Cohen to do anything wrong. Cohen's response to that. I don't think there's anybody that believes that. He directed me to make the payments. He directed me to become involved in these matters. 
This interview taking place after Cohen was sentenced to three years in prison Wednesday by a federal judge here in New York on tax evasion, campaign finance violations in connection with the hush money deals to two women. That's porn star Stormy Daniels and former playmate Karen McDougal, who both claimed to have had affairs with Mr. Trump before he ran for office, which he has denied. And legal experts say President Trump is invoking the advice of counsel defense in response to the payouts. He says he was following terrible advice from a bad lawyer. Sandra. All right, Laura Ingle, thank you. A lot to talk about now. The list is long with our headliner today, Hogan Gidley, White House Deputy Press Secretary. Sir, thank you for coming back and welcome here to America's Thanks so much for the time. Uh, I know you're aware of the Michael Cohen interview from earlier today. What's the White House reaction on this and what are you hearing from the president on it? Uh, look, quite frankly, for the media to give credence to a convicted criminal uh, who has lied uh, on multiple occasions and self-admitted doing just that is quite frankly laughable. The president has maintained and has said many times he has never instructed Michael Cohen to do anything illegal. And we stand by that. What is the White House expecting, meanwhile, uh, from these Michael Flynn documents that are about to be turned over this afternoon, 3 p.m. deadline the judge has set um, to learn more about what happened with the interaction of the FBI and Michael Flynn in that interview from January 2017? Right. Well, you made the, the best point, probably, and that's the judge himself wanted more information about how this information was obtained. We know James Comey even made comments uh, under oath and said uh, in testimony that, listen, uh, we knew there were things at the White House that weren't set up yet. We took advantage of that to get information. Uh, that's a problem, and I think that uh, the facts will bear themselves out in that, in that case as well. But the fact is, uh, most Americans are concerned about, or should be concerned, I should say, uh, about exactly how this information was obtained, and I think uh, that, that we'll actually know that later on when the, the deadlines are reached. I want to go back to this interview with uh, Harris Faulkner here on Fox from yesterday. Uh, the president talking about Michael Cohen here. Watch. I never directed him to do anything wrong. Whatever he did, he did on his own. He's a lawyer. A lawyer who represents a client is supposed to do the right thing. That's why you pay them a lot of money, et cetera, et cetera. He is a lawyer. He represents a client. I never directed him to do anything incorrect or wrong. Specific question. Did Michael Cohen tell the president if he makes this payment that it could be a crime, it would be illegal? Did he say that? Look, I don't know about that particular part of the private conversation. I know what the president has maintained, that he's, he's never instructed Michael Cohen to break any laws. The fact is, uh, Michael Cohen's a convicted criminal, and the FBI had him dead to rights. And what he decided to do was to reduce his sentence. And in the meantime, he cut a deal and betrayed a former employer. Meanwhile, I want to ask you about this Wall Street Journal report about the uh, president's Inaugural committee uh, currently being investigated by federal prosecutors. Sarah Sanders went on with Martha last night and responded this way to that. That doesn't have anything to do uh, with the president or the first lady. Uh, the biggest thing the president did in his engagement in the inauguration was to come here uh, and raise his hand and take the oath of office. The president was focused on the transition during that time and not on any of the planning president for the inauguration. So can you respond to this? This is the Wall Street Journal headline. Trump inauguration spending under a criminal investigation by federal prosecutors, Hogan. Right. That's ridiculous. And Sarah Sanders was absolutely right. This has nothing to do with the president of the United States, Donald Trump. It has nothing to do with the administration. During transition, as you know, the president had one focus, and that was to come into office, set up a government, and right the wrongs of the Barack Obama administration. He did just that. On inauguration night, everyone knows the president of the United States has one task, to show up, thank everybody for their service, to help him get elected, and dance with the first lady. And that's exactly what he did. Let's talk about the border wall. What comes of this next week when uh, you know there's a deadline? The president said he'll own the thing. Does he still feel that way? Look, what the president owns is the constitutional duty to protect the American people. And what we saw on full display for the world to see in the Oval Office was Chuck Schumer, the head of the Democrats in the Senate, and Nancy Pelosi, the head of the Democrats in the House, say to the American people, we do not stand with you in your protection, we stand with hundreds of thousands of people who are here illegally and unlawfully, as opposed to hundreds of millions of American citizens. That's a dangerous place for an entire political party to say, 
we disregard the safety and security of American communities and American families and instead stand with those who come to this country illegally, many human traffickers, drug traffickers, child smugglers. That's a bad place for them to be, and how the much, president wants that fight all day. How much concern day. is there that you could get the blame for this? Um, and, and if that's the case, the president have any plans next week to address the American people and explain why he's taking the position he's taking? Well, we're talking about several tactics here in the White House and how we can move forward. But, I mean, look, I was standing in the Oval Office and watched Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi give each other nonverbal cues the entire time and basically refuse to give eye contact to the president because they were trying to play off each other. And what they did when the president said, we're going to have this conversation in a transparent way in front of all the world to see, they didn't like that and didn't want that. They prefer those back. Uh, those locked doors and those back rooms smoke filled to make deals and cut deals that hurt the American people. But the president said no more. I'm standing for you, the American people. They are standing for people who are here illegally. That's a big difference in parties. And I think the American people understand just where each camp stands in that, in that you particular matter. You mentioned Chuck, uh, Chuck Schumer several times there. Here he is on the Senate floor on this issue yesterday. If the president really believed what he tweeted this morning, that his new NAFTA would pay for the wall, he wouldn't be threatening to shut down the government. It's not a serious proposal. It's a throwaway idea the president used, used in the campaign and still uses to fire up his base. Yeah, Hogan, I mean, the, you mentioned that Oval Office exchange, and there were some stunning moments, and one of them stunning even to members of the president's own party uh, when he said he would be proud to shut down the government over this. Is there any fear um, in, in the White House that, that the president gave up some, some leverage in this debate with that remark? Now, what he's doing is telling the American people he's proud to stand with them and proud to protect them. For a second there, when you said you were going to play the clip of Chuck Schumer on the Senate floor, I thought you were going to talk about in 2006 when he and Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden and Barack Obama all voted for a border fence act to secure the, the border uh, along the southern area of this country and also vote for border security. Some reason, though, they've changed their tune. And I think one of the reasons why is because Donald Trump is in the White House and they refuse to work with somebody on the right who wants to protect the American people. Also, the political calculus has changed. They feel like they can have these people rush the borders, come into our country, be a drain on society, and then get them as voters later on. It's a deplorable position for them to be in. The president's on the right side, and he's with the American people. Seventy percent of the American people agree with this president on the issue, and for the life of me, I cannot figure out why the Democrats are standing with illegal aliens as opposed to the American people. On that point, again, does he, does he plan to explain to the American people what's, what his position is? Oh, he's done it multiple times in multiple areas. Remember, oh, I get it. October. Listen, he's, I, my, my, he's doing a ton of interviews. I get it. But maybe the Oval Office, maybe the Roosevelt Room, maybe the Rose Garden, perhaps, on a nice day in December. That's a pretty good uh, strategy. You want to come over here maybe and get a job? I, I've and got a job. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's what I thought. But listen, two Octobers ago, uh, this president put forth a 70-point immigration plan. The first part of this year, back in January, we put forth four pillars that we were trying to stand by and explain to the American people just how dangerous the situation is. And Democrats said there was no crisis. There was no danger to the American people. Then the video surface of the caravan throwing rocks at our border agents all along the way, the instances of rape. Uh, convicted criminals in the caravan, terrorists in the caravan, and now all of a sudden the Democrats are nowhere to be found. He wants to have this conversation transparently out in the open. Democrats don't want it because they know they're on the wrong side of the American people. They're adhering to their uh, radical left base and also some of those special interest groups that pad their pockets every election year. Okay. Meanwhile, the uh -huh. president needs a chief of staff, and we have been following this. We kind of know who's been in, who's out. Uh, where do things stand this morning? Who is on the short list? Uh, look, the president said yesterday uh, with the newly elected governors in, in the cabinet room uh, for all the world to see that he had about five people uh, he was considering. We know he'll make a good choice. He wants someone to come in here uh, to support his agenda, help get that agenda passed moving into uh, the next Congress. And he'll do that. Uh, there are a lot of people who want the job. We've whittled down the list now to about five, and the president will make that decision and that announcement when he's ready. Okay. When will, how long will Senator, uh, Secretary Kelly stay on? I'm not sure what the, the actual plan is. I know he's on through at least the end of the year, but I mean, the president yeah. plans I, to I make a decision I heard January 2nd. Quickly. I just didn't know if that was a more pliable date. Could, could he stay on for another month and a half, maybe? 
Give well, look, time. he is. It, it, I, I imagine he, if he and the president need to work a deal out like that, they absolutely can. John Kelly has done an amazing job as chief of staff serving this president. He is uh, a dear friend of mine and one of the funniest people, quite frankly, in the White House mm -hmm. that I know. Uh, but, uh, you know, the president's uh, going to make another pick. And when that pick is announced and, and brought into the office, John Kelly will move on mm -hmm. to his next next deal, which I'm sure will be successful. Is, is there a general expectation on timing for that, that you could manage our expectations year end? Yeah. I think I think the end of the year is right, uh, the beginning of January. But again, it, it's their prerogative. If they want to continue on, if the president hasn't made his mind up yet, then then uh, that I'm sure that they can do that. Mm -hmm. But right now, the president has said he has five people, and he's going to, going to make the announcement eminently. So we expect him to do just that. Good to have you on today. Hope you come back real soon. Got a lot more to go through. Hogan Gidley, thanks from the North Lawn. Thanks, Hogan. Thanks so much. Yes. All right. Meanwhile, Trump slamming General Motors yet again. What he is now saying about the company's decision to announce those big layoffs weeks before Christmas. Also, Sandra sticking with the auto industry, trying to make an announcement that will impact American-made vehicles. The money man Charles Payne has the story on that. He'll join us next. We cannot continue to lose $500 billion a year to China. And I had a fantastic meeting with President Xi. This was a four-hour meeting where everything was agreed on. Now, if we get it down in paper, that'll be another story, but I think we will. An update now for you from Paris, per a prosecutor on the scene there. A fourth person now has died after that Strasbourg Christmas market shooting. Of course, this all happened uh, on Tuesday. Uh, the killer, Sharif Shakat, uh, was, was killed on Thursday by police on a city street there after he opened fire uh, on officers. So a fourth person now dead in this attack and as we know multiple more injured we'll continue to follow this story from you for you from paris in the meantime back here in the u.s 20 past the hour check of the markets we dropped sharply at the open or not not terrible now a bit of a bounce back reports that china's economy is slowing down that's having a big effect out there host of making money charles spain two o'clock fox business with us now hello sir what's the headline from china uh, the economy is, the growth is slowing dramatically across the board. Two important economic data pieces, uh, industrial production, that's the lowest in several years. Retail sales, the lowest, I think it goes back like maybe 10 years or something. Just an enormous slowdown in their economy. So this talks about corporations, it talks about investments, all the way to the average consumer in China. Why the A slowdown? massive slowdown. It's been happening for some time. Uh, but it's been exacerbated, I think, by the trade war. Uh, but it's something and I always invite people, don't just go to January when we look at China's stock market. Look at where it was in 2015. It has been coming down like a rock. And that's why I think President Trump was smart to go engage into this right now. They've got massive debt issues. They've got credit issues. They've got rich people trying to get their money out of the country. They still have 400 million people who are peasants. Uh, you have to deal with that while everyone else is driving cars, they're still on bicycles. They've got some issues there. Now it's a great time for them to come to the table. And by the way, they also did that last night, at least with the auto tariffs. They put them on hold for three months. So we got, you know, the pieces are being moved the, the, on both sides. The, the, you know, actions are being taken, the kind of things you want to see as we build into the ultimate uh, negotiation. Okay, on phase. that topic, Harris asked him about it yesterday. She did. What really makes it fantastic is that we have placed tremendous tariffs on China, that when China sends things into America now, they're paying 25 percent interest on everything they send in. But I released them of that temporarily until the end of the 90 days to see whether or not we could make a deal. But just one thing. After that, I have an additional $267 billion worth of taxes, essentially, to put on China. And they don't want that. Where's that go? They don't want that. No, they don't want that. Uh, no, you know, listen, no one likes to have to do these things. It was, it was, it's, it's necessary. It's been building up. And I really believe there have been concrete steps on China's part. I know the knee-jerk reaction is so frustrating. Anybody out there, particularly investors, and you watch the news, financial news, is to completely dismiss everything that comes out of China, even the actions that they're taking, whether it's the buying half a billion dollars of soybeans in one day, whether it's you know saying we're going to put the, the tariffs on hold, whether it's saying we're going to buy liquid natural gas, and actually doing these things. Both sides would like to see some sort of resolution. So uh, this is leading to... A nervous stock market. Globally, we saw a sell-off as a result of that right. uh, news. But here's the irony, China. though: the China economy slowdown is much more of an economic threat than a tariff story. 
much more because it's the world's second largest economy. Also, Europe had some weak numbers too. We don't want their economy. We don't want their economy to fall apart. We would love to sell them things. Hey, you know what? We love to sell them the products that we make. So we don't want their economy. Uh, speaking to fall of apart. selling, our retail sales are off the hook. Phenomenal. In the holiday season. What is it? Absolutely what, it tell phenomenal. That tells me that the American consumer has more money than they've had in a long time. They've got more confidence that they've had in a long time, and they are going out there buying. Let me tell you something. This number. Today that came out for November, it was through the roof, and the revisions were phenomenal. By the way, GDP, I think it's going to, without, without saying now, this year we will see more than 3% GDP for the entire year. This wow. number put us over the top. Absolutely phenomenal. Here's the bad thing. Real quick, guys, this week investors took more money out of the market than ever before I'll in a one-week period. They got scared. They're paying for the bills, it's, too? It's scaring me, though. No, no, you don't have to, they got the money. They're, they're afraid. They put it in money markets, so it's in cash. They didn't take it all the way out. They put. They took about $90 billion out between ETFs and mutual funds. 81 of that billion is just sitting in their, in their accounts. They got afraid. But here's the problem. Their bearishness is at the highest level since 2011. If you go back, I went back to the data, and I, I just went the last two years, that bearishness was above 48%. The last time was 2011, September 2011. The Dow was at 10,700. Six months later, it was at 13,000. After that, it was February 2016. The Dow was at 15,600. Six months later, 18,500. I'm really worried when people have these sort of emotional meltdowns because six months later, the last two times they did this, the market soared. Wow. So I'm, I'm worried about that. All right. Well. Good data points. Oh, man. I was up all morning wow. working on this. <laughs> but I'm excited. I really, you got to be excited. Opportunity for is what it's you're It's opportunity talking. for us. I don't want people to panic. I understand it's a nervous time. But believe we are the strongest country in the world, and there are times where we have to take a stand. Right See you at 2 o'clock today. Okay. Have a great oh, vacation. Hey. Merry Thank Christmas, sir. Right. There he is. Yeah. He's like Santa Claus. Go get some rest this weekend. We need you back here Monday right. morning. All right. Well, a federal judge taking a close look at the FBI treatment of Michael Flynn and how it handled his interview. Those documents due this afternoon, 3 p.m. Republican Congressman Daryl Issa will join us live next. Also, the president taking a swipe at Michael Cohen, and Cohen is firing back. Our A-team reacts to that interview today. Coming up next. He directed me to make the payments. He directed me to become involved in these matters, uh, including the one with McDougal. The season of adventure sales event is happening now. Land Rover, above and beyond. Do you have any idea how your mattress affects your body and how well you sleep? Is it too hard or too soft, causing you to wake up with sore shoulders, back, or hips? Are you uncomfortable because you're too hot or too cold? Now you can get the total body support you need and the better sleep you want with the new MyPillow mattress topper. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell. When I invented my new MyPillow mattress topper, I made it to have everything you'd ever want in a topper. My mattress... Two standard MyPillows absolutely free. Order now. MyPillow topper delivers on its promise to give me a better night's sleep. I can sleep all night through and it's a miracle for me. Mike's exclusive three-layer design starts with a layer of MyPillow foam, providing you superior support and comfort. The second layer of transitional foam evenly distributes body weight and helps relieve uncomfortable pressure points for optimal comfort. Mike's ultra soft outer layer is a patent day. Order now. I personally guarantee it's gonna change your bed into the most comfortable bed you'll ever own. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit MyPillow.com. It was the holiday season, and in your garage, a brand new John Deere. That's not a mirage. With 60 months financing at 0%, say happy holidays to money well spent. If additional offers are what you desire, visit your John Deere dealer before they expire. Come back, President Trump slamming his former attorney, and today we are hearing from Michael Cohen for the first time since he was sentenced to jail for three years. Let's bring in America's A-team. Juan Williams is here. Fox News political analyst and co-host of The Five, Shelby Holiday from The Wall Street Journal, and Byron York, chief political correspondent for The Washington Examiner. Good morning to all of you. Want to just generally morning. get your thoughts to kick things off. Byron, your first time on the A-team. Good to have you here this morning. Thank you. He's always on our A-team. He's though. always yeah. our A-team. Usually leading off our 9 o'clock hour. But if you could just, you've been writing about this, and, and now you've heard from Michael Cohen since his sentencing. Your thoughts this morning? I don't think it affects a huge, I don't think it affects things all that much. All of this talk we're, we're doing this morning is about Michael Cohen and this campaign finance 
violation that he pleaded guilty to and said President Trump directed him to make. But Michael Cohen is going to jail for three years because he cheated on his taxes and defrauded a bank, and that is what gave prosecutors the leverage uh, over him. And you have to remember, as far as the president's defense is concerned, there are a lot of conservative um, scholars and lawyers who believe this, the Karen McDougal payoff and the Stormy Daniels payoff were not criminal. Mm. They believe that this idea of uh, something that's been done to influence an election has been grossly distorted. So if, if it comes to it, you're going to see the president argue, this wasn't a crime. He pleaded guilty because they nailed him to the wall, but it wasn't a crime. Well, the president could could make that argument, but instead he's calling Michael Cohen a liar and saying that Michael Cohen made these things up to embarrass the president. Um, so his setting up this credibility fight with Michael Cohen may not go over so well with him because you have Michael Cohen admitting in court under oath that he committed these crimes. You have prosecutors saying, we believe Michael Cohen. We have evidence that corroborates it. And Michael Cohen's going to jail for three years. It's a little difficult to say he's lying just to embarrass me at this point. Um, but I also think Michael Cohen's interview this morning was interesting because he acknowledged that he is still willing and open to cooperate with not just the special counsel, but also the uh, Southern District of New York, the New York Attorney's Office, and other. It makes you wonder what he knows. And he, he, you know, the question's been asked, what's he hiding uh, that he has on President Trump? Yes. I think the question should be asked, what's he hiding about himself? Yes. And, for his family. and we don't know what that answer is, A or B. Uh, Juan, where were you on the Cohen thing this morning? Well, I think that there's so much going on here, but the one thing that I would say is, that the prosecutors clearly think that a crime occurred. And, you know, it doesn't matter left or right if the prosecutors believe so and are pursuing it. The additional factor here is David Pecker from the National Enquirer. Pecker, is it Pecker? Yeah. Pecker. David Pecker, Pecker yeah. Uh, from the National Enquirer, who said that it was, in fact, intended to influence the outcome of the election. The president was trying to hide the fact that he had had these affairs with these women and didn't want it to come out. So the timing is critical. So you can have people argue, well, you know, everybody wants to cover up things that could hurt their families or embarrass them. But it's the critical timing here, right before the election, that I think the prosecutors have honed in on. And so it's not I mean, only these Cohen, election violations. it's also the publisher I mean, of that tabloid. Uh, uh, different interpretations for all this law. But, but Byron, you write a piece, why Republicans shrug off the Michael Cohen case. Mm -hmm. Why is that? What is your conclusion? Because, because they don't believe this is an actual campaign finance violation. That, that paying off a woman for her silence, in this case, uh, may be unethical. It may be a really bad thing to do. But it does not violate the campaign finance laws. And another case, another uh, argument the president might make is that, uh, well, the short ways to say it is, I've been paying off women for years when I wasn't running for anything. So therefore, this was not because of a specific election. This is perhaps a pattern. I think the timing is exactly to the contrary, because it's right before the election and you have people who corroborate what we've heard from Cohen. Well, I would what just what about one other this? Thing too. If you're a private businessman, right? You're Michael Bloomberg. You're running for president. You're a couple months for the election. You tell your guy, "Hey, man, all these lawsuits against me. Just go ahead and settle them. Let's get them out of the way." Is that a violation? Is that is that intended to influence the outcome of the election? Of course it is, because you yes. right. know, in the sense that you want to get the table clean. Doesn't mean you're cheating in any way, but you want to clear no, the table. No, you're defrauding the American people well, so by is the, it, the denying them information on which to cast their vote. Is it fraud, Shelby, or is it just trying to clear the decks? Well, there are good arguments both ways, but the Journal has been doing a lot of reporting on this, and they place President Trump. This is more than a month ago we had a story where President Trump had a meeting with David Pecker in 2015 and said, David, what can you do to help my campaign? And they discussed this idea of buying stories, catching and killing stories about women. And so because from 2015 up until after the Access Hollywood tape dropped, this was talked about in the context of the election, it could be a problem for the president. But you okay. raise a good point. I believe Trump settled the Trump University lawsuit uh, when it was getting, he was getting a lot of heat during the campaign. But that wasn't accepting a corporate donation or an illegal campaign fund. But wasn't it to, but he, if he settled it, wouldn't that be to influence the uh, course of the election? But that's not an illegal contribution. That's him settling What's a lawsuit. What's illegal about paying a woman? So the corporate donation from AMI, um, which AMI is cooperating Only with if it's investigators, actually a campaign but they've said it is. In the statement of facts, they acknowledge this was made intended to help the president. But if it were used against the president, he would have a different point of view. And, and, and this is where it goes deep but down the rabbit hole, yes. on and on again. Here's Cohen earlier today on ABC. Watch this, and we'll hear from the president, too. Those charges were just agreed to him by him in order to embarrass the president and get a much reduced prison sentence. I know which tweets you're talking about. 
First of all, it's absolutely not true. Um, I did not do it to embarrass the president. The truth is, I told the truth. I took responsibility for my actions. And instead of him taking responsibility for his actions, what does he do? He attacks my family. It's not said in that interview, too. I think with the Southern District of New York, too, there's a wide open question here. And Cohen pointed to that about the information they have. Where that goes, I do not know. Here's how the president reacted just yesterday on this one. He was a lawyer. And because of that, I did it. And you know what? In retrospect, I made a mistake. Because what he did was all unrelated to me, except for the two campaign finance charges that are not criminal and shouldn't have been on there. They put that on to embarrass me. They put those two charges on to embarrass me. They're not criminal charges. One other thing about Michael Cohen, when you talked about what else he might have, a lot of speculation about that. A lot of things may involve Trump businesses that he knows about. But remember, one of the reasons we heard about him was in, in connection with alleged collusion with the Russians in the 2016 campaign. And the, so, the famous dossier said that he met with Russians in Prague for the specific purpose of paying off the Russians for this hacking operation. Now, Michael Cohen has denied this all over the place. And it's going to be interesting to see where that goes. Mm. I think it's really interesting from the interview to hear, one, the president go after Cohen's family. I think that may, in fact, antagonize Cohen. And as you saw, saw in the interview, Cohen mentions this. He goes after Cohen's wife, Cohen's father-in-law. And now I think it puts Cohen back in a position where previously you might have said, well, I've got three years, as Byron pointed out. You know, he was guilty of tax fraud and other issues. But I think it puts him back now and saying, wait, the president's going after me. I feel like I had been loyal to him, covering up for what he called his dirty deeds. And now they're back in the middle of this fisticuffs. Shelby, could you just conclude for us today, there's this deadline for the, uh, the judge has ordered these documents to be turned over from the FBI's uh, interview with Michael Flynn, what we expect today? We, well, we don't know what's in the actual document, but I, the judge wants to see it before he makes a decision on Flynn's sentencing, which is expected next week. And I think maybe what Flynn filed last week in his sentencing memo worked politically in a sense that he's still admitting he lied and he's still acknowledging wrongdoing, that he lied to FBI agents. But he floated this notion that he was interviewed by Peter Strzok and was set up by Andy McCabe. And that has caused the president and a lot of President Trump supporters to come out and say, he I don't may, know about he this. He may I'm have not found sure the right interview. judge to find this out, though. Exactly. Right. That's, that's a very good Sullivan. point. Quickly. Well, this may be encouraging for Flint supporters, but we cannot read Judge Sullivan's mind. Judge Sullivan always wants to see all the evidence on either yeah. side, but that does not mean he's going to do that's anything terrible. in reaction to it. Nice shirt, Juan. You know, I got Sh it from your closet. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> Show me nice to have you back. Byron, stand by, here. okay? Meanwhile, Thank Melania you. Trump now opening up on a personal side in a revealing interview with Sean Hannity, the first lady slamming the media for uh, the way they treat her 12-year-old son. We'll play that out for you and let you know how she characterized it. I'd like to... I'm going to bring up John Kasich and I'm going to bring up Arizona Senator Jeff Flake. Uh, because they say they may run against you in 2020. I hope so. What do you say to these men who think they have a shot in 2020. I think I have the greatest base in the history of politics. I have people that I love and that love me, frankly. That includes a lot of women. So with Harris yesterday, he uh, talked about how unimpressed he was about potential Republican challengers. Back with the A-team, Juan Williams in a nice-looking shirt. Shelby Holiday and Byron York. What do you Come think, on. Byron? Someone take him on or not? Uh, I think it's a real, real possibility. Uh, there's been talk of John Kasich, the Ohio governor, or Jeff Flake. Uh, but I think, I think the thing is, uh, unless the world changes in some big way, there's no way a challenger is going to beat President Trump in Republican primaries. Has huge, the president has huge support among Republicans, and that's not going to work. But people who are organizing this do say no sitting president who has been primaried for re-election has gone on to win. They're talking about Jimmy Carter. Uh, they're talking about Gerald Ford. They're talking about George H.W. Bush. So the idea would be to damage Trump enough in the primaries so that he could not win re-election. Shelby? Well, Senator Jeff Flake is one of the people who says whether or not he runs, he wants to see somebody run against President Trump. And it's for that reason. He doesn't think President Trump, he's made it very clear, he doesn't think he's a great president. He wants to see him challenged. It, the idea would be to weaken President Trump and possibly to hurt him down the road. But 
the risk is that you lose the presidency to Democrats. So if these Republicans like Senator Flake or John Kasich are willing to allow that outcome to happen, that's, that's where they have to make do, the decision. Do you think Flake or Kasich would be significant in any way? Do you think they would be substantial? I, th I agree with my to, colleagues. To soften up the, no, I agree with the my beachhead, colleagues. as they're saying? <laughs> well, that's exactly. But, you know, listening to President Trump, especially his comment about women, it's just like you, you, you sit there and you go, what? Is, what is he talking well, about? That. On that point, go ahead, Sandra, right? Roll it. I have tremendous women support, but if you remember the last election, I was worried I wouldn't get one woman in the whole United States to run. And I got tremendous. I mean, Hillary wished she had my numbers, okay? Hillary got trounced with women. And, and I'll tell you something, um, the news and the polls are really fake, but I have the greatest base in history. He sets you up. He's unbelievable. I mean, I just love him because, he, you know, for, for our purposes, you can't stop talking about what he's saying. It's all unbelievable. I mean, he just says things that are crazy. Hillary wish he had my number. Well, you know what? Maybe among, he, he won among white women, but he lost women of all kinds. And then in the midterms elections, the gender gap was 23 points. 23 Shelby, points. what about that support? And he specific, let me just finish this point. The women were critical to the fact that the Democrats were able to capture 40 seats because you look at those suburban districts, it wasn't men that switched back from Trump to the Democrats, it was women, and it was educated white women. So for him to say this, I've okay. got the greatest Speaking of women, here's, women. The, here's the first lady. She's defending her son in this interview with Sean Hannity. It aired last night. Here's what she said. It does make me angry because children should be off limits and uh, I protect him and I want to give him normal life as possible. Uh, this is not normal life, but I like to protect him and give him the childhood that he deserves. She answered a lot of questions about just that, that the, the criticism that her family receives, um, their family's name, and her son is still very young and the target of a lot of criticism himself. Yeah, I can't imagine what it's like to be Melania Trump in a White House where you have these scandals swirling. The president denies these affairs with these women, but it is the biggest news of the week right now. People are talking about his payouts to a porn star and a former Playboy playmate. Um, and you have the bullying and you have the online comments. So I... I Everyone agrees. Children in the White House should be off limits, especially 12-year-olds who, you know, are going about their daily lives. However, I do think there are bigger questions about what this family has to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and the kind of information that Barron might be getting from the news. Well, it is a really, really simple rule about just don't yep. bring up the children. And I will say, overall, I mean, how much have we read about any secret information about Barron Trump? I haven't. Mm -hmm. And so I think most people are observing the rule as they should. I agree. What do you think she's talking about, then? I don't know. I, I, well, I think what Shelby said, which is all of the derogatory news General about Parenting, the president and all of the things that, that he would read if he, you know, surfs the net, oh. uh, could have a damaging effect, certainly. Thanks, all three of you, right? Juan, Shelby, you. Byron, nice to have you. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Uh, we are blasting off into space, into history, too. One of the rocket ships reaching space for the first time. Could tourism soon extend to the final frontier? We'll put that question to a man who has been there. Private space travel. Who's on board? Three, two, one, release. Clean release. Motor firing. Good ignition. Good control. 51.3 miles, about 82 kilometers. We made it to space. That right there is a big deal. One giant leap for Virgin Galactic. Private Enterprise completing its longest ever rocket-powered flight yesterday. They hit an altitude of 50 miles, and the two pilots on board are considered astronauts. Mike Massimino is an astronaut from NASA, senior advisor for space programs at the Intrepid Museum here in New York City. Hello. Hello. Fascinating. Thanks for What's having it me. Cool stuff, isn't it? Uh, well, one of those guys you mentioned, uh, they are both considered astronauts. One of them already was, C.J. Sturkow. He's a friend of mine who I work with uh, in the astronaut office for, for many years. So um, congratulations to those guys. But I think this is, this is really a big step. Virgin Galactic has been looking into the tourist business of flying people into space for, for many years now. They had an accident a few years ago, which was a bad situation four years ago. And now they've turned that around with some successful tests and finally now getting uh, people, two of their test pilots, into space on their vehicle. Which How much is of a reality is that becoming? I know it's been talked about for a long time. I mean, yes. Are we talking this lifetime? That that's a it's, it's, yeah. No, this is going to have. Well, this was this was exactly what 
they wanted to have happen in the near future was being able to successfully launch people into space and have them come back successfully, safely. And they're going to do a few more tests, I'm sure. I don't know exactly what their plan is or what their time frame is, but this is a huge step. This opens up the door to having more private citizens, more people experience space travel. That's huge demand, it's, right? Well, the, I think he sold over 600 seats already for this for this spaceship that he has, uh, wow. Richard Branson, for that. Um, but but it's, it's really significant. If you look at uh, airplanes going way back 100 years ago, you know, Wright Brothers took that first, that first flight, and then it was used for military reasons and for, uh, for, for government reasons, air, air travel was. And then we had, it was barnstorming, we really didn't know what to do with it. And then it turned into this commercial airplane uh, industry that we have now, where we, every second we have an airplane taken off from if, somewhere. If you're going to get the space tourism here, from liftoff until you hit 50 miles and then you come back down, yeah. How long is that ride? Uh, I think the, the, the ride in total, I, th I think, is, is more significant than that because I think it's you know, getting to altitude and, and so on. And so I, the experience, I think, is, is more than just a few minutes. But your, your experience in zero gravity, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how much time they have, but it's enough to get the idea. It's enough to float around. It's enough to take a look at the view, to see the sun in a black sky, which is kind of cool, to see the horizon, to see the atmosphere, and to get a, an idea of how beautiful our planet is. So I think this is a great way to experience spaceflight. And the other companies, too, are going to be doing this. But, but Blue Branson, Origin, Branson beat what? Bezos? Yeah, I don't know if I'd and spell it. Beat. I, think they're all, I don't know if they're really in competition because they're different models. Uh, Bezos has a, a vehicle that is going to launch and return pretty much to the same place, not from a, necessarily from a runway, from, from a launch pad, and then come back. Uh, it's not going to have any pilots on board. It's almost kind of almost like, a, like an amusement park ride, sort of, you know, where you're going, getting inside, going up and coming back. Uh, Branson's is a little bit different experience. SpaceX is going to be sending people to the International Space Station going to orbit, which is, again, a much a, a different experience. So I think each of them have their own purpose. I don't necessarily see them com competitive. I think they're actually synergistic. I also think there's the one thing not to forget here. It's also the scientific benefit as well. They had four experiments on board this Virgin Galactic flight. So when you can get to zero gravity, not only can you do it for the tourism reasons, but also for scientific discovery, which is what they did even on this test flight. It's a, it, I can't believe we're talking. I mean, it, it sounds like things are getting closer to this being a reality. Yeah, it, it, it is amazing. This was a dream that people had many years ago and was never really something. I remember hearing about this maybe 10, 15 years ago when he started talking about these commercial companies and there's something called the X Prize to get people into space. And I was very skeptical. I remember hearing the briefings when I was an astronaut, kind of sitting there. I can remember in the back of the room, which is where I normally sat, but sitting in the back room hearing it, I was like, there's no way this is going to happen. Because I knew what it took for the government to fly people into space. I never thought a private company can do it. But this is what they're doing. And cool soon stuff. we're going to be flying astronauts to the space station. On, with Boeing and SpaceX, and it's it's a new era that's coming. And uh, wow. I don't know if we really, it's so cool, I don't know if we really realize what it means. I'll see <laughs> it's you. It's going to be exciting. I, know. I hope I so. I like your we'll excitement about no, it. Merry Christmas, sir. All right. I'll see you. Merry Christmas. Thanks Thank for you, having Mike. me. Well, it's President Trump versus Michael Cohen. As the president and his former attorney sit down for dueling interviews, both sides firing accusations at each other. We will dig into all of this for you. And the latest on these, this story with Chris Wallace, he is on deck, joins us next.